Let's turn our Bibles to Book of Proverbs, Proverbs 14, 14. Proverbs 14, 14. Proverbs 14, 14, familiar verse. Proverbs 14, 14. The title of the message is, Are You Still Backsliding? Are You Still Backsliding? Proverbs 14, 14. Are You Still Backsliding? The Bible says, Proverbs 14, 14. The backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways, and a good man shall be satisfied from himself. Brother Jay, can you please pray for the message? Father God, we thank you once again for the gathering of us here in our local Bible group and church where we can hear your word. We ask you that you fill our passage in with your Holy Spirit, give him the liberty, authority, and power to declare your word unto us. Help us to open our hearts, minds, and ears to your word. Help us not to drop anything that's said from the pulpit. Help us to hide those words in our hearts so that we will not sin against you. Father God, we ask you that you will protect us from devil's attack. Help us to fully give ourselves up to your word and focus and not on things and not focus on the things that are happening outside or even the things that are happening in our lives. But just focus on what you want us to hear today and to change from inside out to be better Christians for you. We're definitely living in the last days, wicked days, Lord God, where sound doctrine is preached and people do not endure sound doctrine. Father God, we ask you that you will bestow a little more grace upon each and one of us. Help us to keep fight the good fight of faith. Help us to stand firm in your word and not compromise. Yes. Father God, uh, we just want to see you, Lord. There's nothing more important than to see you. Pray for your soon return. Uh, do come back, help each and one of us to be about the Father's business. Help us to put you first, always. Mm -hmm. We thank you and love you. Just name pray. Amen. 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 It's a very familiar topic, backsliding. And as we've discussed in the past, you know, doctrinally sleep, or speaking, Christians can backslide, but you won't burn in hell. Amen. So that's a great thing. Amen. You know, if you see backsliding in the Word of God, you see how Israelites, you know, turn themselves away from the Lord. That's why the Lord wanted them to repent and come back. As Christians, you and I can be out of balance very quickly. You know, it's easy to backslide because when you're out of balance, it's very easy to lean one way or the other. It's very hard to just stay in the middle and keep the balance in anyone's life. And as a Christian, I'm not sure how you're doing when it comes to staying right in the middle where you could be in the perfect balance. In order to be perfect in the perfect balance, you have to understand that I have to be in the will of God you know, every day of my life. I mean, are you really in the will of God? That's a question that every Christian should ask. Let's go to just a couple chapters behind. Proverbs chapter 11. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 1. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 1. So first thing is that in order to check if you're still backsliding, you have to check your balance. You know, you have to check your balance. The Bible says in Proverbs 11, verse 1, a false balance is abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. Because you're out of balance, you tend to skewer towards something other than Lord Jesus Christ. Sure. You know, perfect balance means that you're faithful in every little thing in your life. You're faithful to church, you're faithful to your family, you're faithful to your work, you're faithful to all the co-workers and everything else. However, when you are out of balance, you can't be faithful in everything because you start not seeing it. For example, if I'm standing right in the middle, you know, I could turn around and see everybody in this room. However, if I'm skewed towards this way more, 
and then I go out and I could only turn like a 180 this way. I could, I can't really see that side. A lot of times what happens to Christians is that you go so far to one side, you just can't see the other side. Sometimes it's your family. You know, I think the saddest thing that I do see in the ministry is that someone's so gung-ho in the ministry and they love the word of God, they love the Lord, they say, and they love the people of the church, but they don't like their family. It's like, man, I love to be at church. I love to be in the ministry, street preaching, visitation. I love to have fellowship, but I don't want to be at home. Man, what's wrong with that picture, right? Foundation has to be home. I mean, if your home is not right, your unbalanced life will never get right. I mean, God put Lord Jesus Christ as head of the household, and there's the husband, wife, and children. But if you do not take care of your home, your balance will never become just, I guess, justified. Your balance wouldn't be just. So what does that tell you? A lot of people who does not love their spouses like they should are backslidden. It, it doesn't matter. You could be like pretending. You could witness to thousand souls in the past week. You could pass out 10,000 tracts, but if you have any kind of bitterness, if you have any kind of hate, if you have any kind of, you know, anything that's not right about your spouses and you don't want to get right, then you are going to stay in a backslidden stage. That little joy that you have serving the Lord will just dissipate. It is like a real vapor. It just cannot be lasting. Why? Because you are not spending time and your focus is not in your family. A lot of times, people try to sacrifice their family to get ahead in their careers. We see it all the time. You know, people, I got to get promotion. I got to get a better job. You know, we need this and that. And truly, you're saying that I'm doing this for my family. Are you really? Did you really discuss with your wife? Did you really discuss with your family? Your children, your mom and grandpa, everybody, right? Or is it just you trying to show off or prove to people that I could do this? A lot of times people get kind of confused. I'm doing this for you. You're not. You're doing this for yourself. You know, yeah, I'm doing this for you, John. I'm doing this for you, Jane. I'm doing this for you, children. But you really aren't. You're always doing it for yourself, and you're trying to justify your actions by saying that I'm doing it this for others. You know, devil has deceived you greatly. If you think that whatever you're doing justifies because you're doing it for others without really praying to God, without really reading the word of God, without really knowing what's right or wrong, then you're going to stay in that backslidden state. And as you die as a backslidden Christian, I mean, you're going to lose your rewards. I'm pretty sure your family relationship was a mess. I'm sure you were known as a hypocrite. You know, last thing I want to ever see or hear is that someone who comes to the church, they seem like a good brother or sister in front of people, but behind the scenes, they're like the worst husband, wife, and children. And it always gets exposed. You know, backsliders need to understand you're not going to burn in hell, but God will expose you, yes. right? If your heart is not right with the Lord, it will be exposed. And that's something how God does it. You reap what you sow. Be sure your sin will find you out. You can't hide it. No. I mean, that's one thing I've learned since I've gotten saved. I cannot hide the truth from the Lord. The truth will always come out and prevail. It's just that, quote-unquote, smart Christians, when they know they did something wrong, when they know if they're in a mess, when they know that their family life is wrong, you know, their relationships are wrong, they hear, listen, they know the conviction from the Holy Ghost, and then they get right. That's all you got to do. Amen. It's a simple solution. You just get right with the Lord, and then you reconcile. You get right with your family. I mean, husband and wife, 
shouldn't be so cold towards each other until we go to heaven. You know, but it's true in a lot of cultures, right? Yes. It's a funny question, but I don't know. I mean, if you had the chance to marry your spouse again, right? Would you do it? And don't look at each other right now. I mean, just answer in your heart, right? I mean, would you do it? But, you know, some people say, I'm so honest. Definitely no. I mean, that's not a, you know, that's not a good answer. You know, if you're saying that, right? Then definitely something wrong with you. When you chose that person to marry each other till death do us apart, that means they were number one in your life. What changed since then, right? You changed. Because the other person, I'm pretty sure, had false top to bottom, just like before and just like after. And you accepted it. You liked it no matter what. Well, what changed, right? Your balance changed, right? You became unbalanced. Yes. You're only seeing that person's worst of that person. You know, when you look at when you try to find people's fault, you can find it because nobody's perfect, right? That's what politicians do all the time, you know? They look for each other's faults all the time. And if you, you know, dig deep enough, you'll find some dirt always. But is that what your Christian family relation is supposed to be? So you need to have a right balance in your family life. Without it, you are going to be out of balance. You're going to be in a backslidden state. You know, this thing about, you know, if I just concentrate just witnessing for the Lord 24-7, I'm fine. It's not fine. The Lord wants it to be balanced. Amen. You know, you have to be a good testimony every part of your life. Think about it. Now there's a family part. Now there's the outside part, right? There's a work-life balance. There's a school-life balance. You know, out of this church and outside your home, do you have right balance at work? Because many people work, right? Do you work your best, right? You know, whatsoever you do it heartily as unto the Lord, not unto man. So are you doing your best at work? But also, are you making sure that work doesn't take precedence or priority over God and your family? Some people love work so much that, you know, they love whenever they hear the word overtime, you know, they're the first ones to sign up, right? You know, I want to show to people that I could work 80 hours a week, you know? I want to work 120 hours a week, you know? If I could work all the time, I just want to work because I love to sing that paycheck, you know, you know, with extra numbers in the back. But at what cost, right? We talk about it all the time. That's you actually loving the money. Yes. Nothing else to it. I mean, you're a fool. You're a liar. I need this money. I need this money. No. Last time I checked, before that, God provided all your needs and you were fine. What changed? Your greed. Your covetousness. I'm not saying that you don't work hard. I never said that. You work hard. But why do you have to sacrifice things of God? Why do you have to sacrifice your family? Why do you have to sacrifice your relationship with Lord Jesus Christ just to make that extra buck? I always tell everybody, you know, you really want to be straight with money. That's why, you know, money transactions, you know, shouldn't really happen inside the church amongst the brethren. Fast way to break up a relationship fast way to destroy the church, right? When people start, you know, dealing with money inside the church, you just do it, you know, outside. But there are special cases, you know, so there's always, you know, special circumstances and cases. But however, you know, if we are all about money, 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 then what do you think is going to happen in your life, right? Everything's going to revolve around money, 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 money then that's why people get bound by work. Okay, you have to work on Sunday now. In the past, you're like, oh, you know, no way. I, I can't even consider. You know? I can't work a job where I have to work on a Sunday continuously, right? 
But now you're like, you know what? I got a family, you know. I got some other things to do, you know. I think I'm going to need it. You're like, okay. You start accepting those, you know, assignments on Sunday. And now you don't show up on Sundays anymore, literally. Not because you're sick, not because of anything, but because of work. But you brought it to yourself. I mean, it was completely false balance. This love of money just took control. It weighs the most. And then everything else is just up there, and including things of God, family, and everything. So false balance is abomination to the Lord. Then you're living an abominable life. Do you understand? If you're out of balance, you're living an abominable life to the Lord. In the sight of the Lord, you're an abomination. You're a saved Christian, but you're still an abomination. Yes. Right? I mean, you look at your children. Man, that's my son. Man, but he's an abominable son. You know? It's like telling you're a good son. I have a good son. I have a bad son. Good daughter and bad daughter. You know what? You know what? There's a good adjectives for describing each person. Thank God that once you're saved, you're going to go back to heaven once and for all, yeah. right? But during this life, you have to check yourself. Where does work stand in my life? Does that stand between me and my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Does that stand between me and my family, my church, and the spiritual things? I never seen God not work in a way when someone had desire, especially they want to serve him, and then they're like, Lord, I need my work schedule to change so that I could serve you, still providing me and my family's needs. I've never seen a case where the Lord did not open the door. Only time the Lord did not open the door is because of you. you. You are greedy. You're super greedy and covetousness. You want to get that extra money to show off to people. Literally, what's the point, right? You know, I thought about it, right? If I was a billionaire, what am I going to do with those money, right? I say, oh, I'm going to give it to all the missionaries in the world. You know, it doesn't work like that, right? You know, I'm going to build the greatest church in the world for our church. Eh, I don't think so, right? Literally, you're just going to spend money on yourself and your family. And then you're just going to start showing off. And the pride comes in, right? And then you start looking down on people. You know, you're like, oh, you know, watch. His watch, man, I got some like, you know, 10 Rolexes, but all they have is, you know, you know, those, you know, calculator watches, right? <laughs> Which I like a lot, you know? And then now you start looking down at people. Oh, well, what kind of purse? What kind of shoes? What kind of backpack? You know, what kind of pants? You know, everything. <laughs> Why? Because you become so materialistic. Yes. You love work, you become materialistic, right? You become very superficial. You know, superficial Christians are the worst, yes. right? They're flattering Christians, you know? They're flatterers, yeah. you know? Nothing coming out of from them is genuine. I can't really deal with those people. You probably can't either. So every word coming out of you, can I trust it, right? Like, you're telling everybody they're the best looking person in the world, right? You're a liar, right? I mean, you're saying everybody, they're the prettiest person in the world. You're a liar. Or, I mean, you're no different than Newsom's of the world. Politician. Yeah. Have the politician. Then think about it. Is my work, is it balanced right now? Is it, right? And for young people, your study, right? Study. Is your study life balanced? You know, a lot of cultures, they put study above anything. They put study above your life. Like they'd rather you die as the top student than you know you being healthy and you know you know live a okay life. You know it's like if you don't go to certain college, you know you're a disgrace to the family, right? Well, what what is that to Christian family, especially a Bible believing family? Does your child have to li literally go to certain college? Or they, are they a failure if they've done their best? They let them do their best. And if their best is certain place, then that's what it is. Yeah. They don't have to go to a prestigious college to make you happy. Then you're just a selfish parent. Your job is to, you know, instruct them in the right way, right? 
admonish them, lead them, and guide them in the right way. Your job isn't to live your life through them. Right. You know, a lot of so-called parents always want to live their life through their children. You know? I never got to go to that college, so you have to go. I never got to do that, so you have to do it. I'm going to live my life through you. Man, that's why a lot of children, even inside you know, church, even though they have a Christian parents, they have so much pressure. And kids with too much pressure, you know what happens? They go out to the world. You know? Why? Because peer pressure and pressure go hand in hand. Kids with a lot of peer pressure, you know, family pressure, you know, they start trying to relieve that tension and nervousness. So what do they do? They go to drugs, right? Yeah. You know, they sleep with each other, right? Yeah. You know, they start smoking, right? Yeah. And they do all these bad things. And then parents, naive parents are like, oh, my child is an angel, right? <laughs> they don't even know what the definition of angel is in the first place. But my child is an angel, you know? But before you know it, you know, they've been doing drugs since the junior high days, right? You know? I mean, they have a hidden kid somewhere, right? I mean, they messed up with their report card. They've been, you know, changing the grace because you're not, you don't even know, right? I, don't know. I mean, in some cases, they create their own diploma or buy diploma from a very, you know, good, I guess they're good at it, right? Oh, yeah, this person graduated from, you know, Princeton with their name on it. I mean, they're really good. There are a lot of good copycats, right? You know? And then they're like, oh, yeah, my child went to you know, Princeton. But come to find out, they never went there. They never did anything. They don't even have the right job, right? So they've been living a lie. And a lot of times, you know, ultimately, it's their fault, but it could be attributed to the parents. Parents, Christian parents, if your child is doing their best, give him, give him good balance. Don't sway their balance with your greediness, covetousness, and with your desire for them to live your own life because you never met your own expectations. You, know, you have to understand that, right? Your children aren't like your toys you know, that you live through or like you know, whatever, your clone. It's not. They have their own souls, personality, characteristics. You just help them. Yes. You got to be a good testimony for them. And that's why, you know, as students, you do your best. But if you know your brain, I understand brain a little bit and studying for many, many years. There are certain things that you know you cannot go over, right? I mean, do you expect someone who cannot, I guess, understand the concept of calculus per se? to go rise above and beyond and know all about physics and get into the realms of you know, nuclear physics and stuff. But that's what parents think. My child is so smart. He or she just have to get over the hump and they'll become that scientist, engineer, lawyer, and doctor that I expected them to be. No, you're just a fool. Right. And I wonder if you ever pray for God's will in their life instead of your own will. You, know, you always pray, Lord, my will is that my, no, no, I mean, God, I know that your will is that my child goes to, you know, this school, right? It's not, you already said it, it's not your will, I mean, it's not God's will, it's your will. Yeah. So get rid of your will in your children's life. And then, you know, if you, children, if you grow up and if you get married and if you ever have family, if Lord tarries, you have to have the same type of mindset. I want God's will in my children's life, Amen. not my will. Once your will gets in the way, forget about it. You know, you got to be back. You never get out of your backslidden slate, right? That's why there are very few Christians out there who's not backsliding at all. Almost every Christian is in one way or the other backsliding. Why? Because none of us are perfect. So it's a great reminder to both of us. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. So are you still backsliding? Check your balance. So first thing is you got to check your balance. That's, let's look at the second thing. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We're going to look at verses 11 through 13. 
1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 11 through 13. The Bible says, Now all these things happen unto them for in samples, and they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. There is no temptation taken in you, but such as is common to men. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. What's point number two, right? In the first one, you know, having false balance, you'll be still backsliding. Second one, when you don't know who you really are, you'll continue to backslide. Who am I, right? I'm just a sinner saved by grace. And according to Isaiah, I'm like less than nothing, right? Because if I don't realize that, what happens? Verse 12 happens. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. We start becoming proud. You know, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. That pride could come in so quickly to you and me. I mean, this pride thing is so prevalent that it was a cause of devil's destruction. Lucifer. You and I, if we don't check our pride on a daily basis, you know what happens? Temptation comes our way, and we don't rely on the Lord to defeat it. Why do people backslide essentially, right? Because you can't win against those temptations. Because temptation comes your way even right now. I mean, devil, the world, the flesh is constantly tempting you to sin against the Lord. But Bible says in verse 13, God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted of that you are able. So you and I can overcome, defeat every temptation through the Lord Jesus Christ. However, when you don't rely on the Lord, when you don't realize that you could fall all the time, you're going to backslide. You're going to be in that slate all the time, backsliding state all the time. You know, funny thing is that when someone defeats temptation a little bit, maybe two, three times, right, and they suddenly become, okay, I could defeat it all the time, right? That's when they fall. It's usually in a Christian's walk with the Lord, if you examine it, just, you know, think about certain sins that, you know, you struggled against, right? And then, you know, like, okay, uh, let's just do a simple one, right? Just drugs, right? Drugs, you know, because I know not everybody here or listening has done drugs, but, you know, just prime example. Like, okay, before I've gotten saved, I was a, you know, druggie. Drug addict, I did drugs all the time, right? And then you're like, okay, after I've gotten saved, you know, I had some relapse, but last six months to a year, you know, I haven't done it. And people are like, wow, wow, you did great, you know. Man, you're doing good. Instead of giving glory to God for everything, you're like, oh, yeah, I think I'm pretty good. Well, this, this drug thing is a piece of cake, you know. It's okay, you know. Lord, help me in the beginning. Now I could just do it on my own. You might say, I don't think like that, but your actions do, right? And the way you act. And then suddenly, what happens? So during these moments, when you are proud, especially after you think that you have defeated some sins and overcame some temptation in your life, what happens is that something comes in your life, which is a trial or tragedy. It just happens. Some hardship comes along the way. Then people who's not balanced, people who is not close with the Lord, but people who are backsliding, they will sin. They will go back to that sin. Don't tell me it doesn't happen to me. It happens to you already or it's going to happen to you. Right? For example, so you've defeated not doing, you know, Drugs for like a year. But suddenly, you were in a relationship. You thought you guys were going to get married with each other. But there was a breakup. 
Man, now you're in a really, really low state in your life. Instead of going to the Lord, instead of going to the Word of God, instead of doing things of God, now, because you were so proud in thinking that you defeated that temptation on your own, suddenly, drugs everywhere around you. And then you're like, you know what? Some, I have to, you know, I have a justification to commit this sin today. I had a, such a hard breakup. It, could be, it doesn't have to be a breakup, right? It could be your health failing. It could be, you know, losing your job. It could be, I don't know, great big fighting between the spouses, children, or whatnot. Some kind of trials or tribulation. Then devil says, you know, I got a hold of you. I got a hold of you, son. I got a hold of your daughter, right? Yeah. I got you. And then you do it. Guarantee you're going to do it. Or if you haven't done it already, I mean, just look at your life. You know, it's a, it, you know, Dr. Rockman always says it, you know, wise people always says it, right? History always repeats itself. Human beings never learn from history anyways. If someone went through the same processes, you're going through the same processes. You have the same solutions, and you have same so failures. It's no different with Christians. So when that situation comes or came, you went back to the sin. It doesn't matter how long it's been. It could have been five years. It could have been 10 years. But you'll still go back to that sin. If you're not careful, if you have the wrong balance, if you think you're better than something who you are, except nothing but a wretched sinner, less than nothing, and once pride gets in the way, forget about getting out of that backsliding slate. You are going to commit that sin again. That's why you have to be careful. As you get closer to the Lord, devil's closer to you. And that little wedge of room that you give devil's going to slither their in, and they're going to say, okay, you're pretty good. Give 99% glory to God and keep that 1% to yourself. It's fine. When they're applauding, glorifying God, you know, when you're talking to people about witnessing to others, just take some. Take some accolade, right? You know, let them say, well done, so-and-so brother. Well done, so-and-so sister. You get all the glory. Maybe not all, you know, some, some, some get it. And then pretty soon, you're like, man, it's just me, right? That's why I'm wary of ever commanding people on the pulpit when it comes to things that you do for the Lord. If I don't talk about it, forget it. You're going to get your reward in heaven, right? Times that I do talk about it, it's an encouragement, you know. I do feel that some people have to hear. But if you have the heart where you go... You know, I'm pretty faithful to the ministry. I don't miss any ministry. Man, but pastor never gives me any, any credit, you know. Well, what's wrong with you? Are you doing that for me? Are you doing it for the people? Or are you doing it for Lord Jesus Christ? Then you should never even expect it. If it does come, you know, just give glory to God. Oh, that's why... There's always reactions of people who's proud and who's not. You give him credit, first reaction is they're like, oh, give glory to God. But some people will be like, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. You know, you know I'm glad, as in that, I'm glad that you acknowledge me for what I've done for the Lord. Okay, you lost your rewards already right now, right? With your heart, right? That's why I think this is one of the greatest, you know, traps that devil has set for Christians. Always. When you're doing some, when you think that you're doing something good, when you're doing something well for the Lord, and you start getting credit, and whenever that trial comes, you always relapse. I mean, what's the point then? Your middle name should be backslider, right? Because... Whenever something hard comes in your life, you just relapse, right? I mean, those are the characteristics of addicts, right? 
I mean, Bible says endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. But endurance is not part of your vocabulary. Sacrifice is not part of your vocabulary, right? Because it doesn't match with the pride, right? So when things get hard, you first thing, instead of going to the Lord for a solution, instead of getting closer with the Lord, because backsliding is what? Getting out of fellowship with the Lord, turning away from the Lord. That's what it is, right? So if you don't have right relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, you're already in a backsliding slate. And if you're asking me what does it mean to be in right relation with Lord Jesus Christ, you're backsliding, right? Right relation with Lord Jesus Christ is that he's in your you know, mind, in everything, in your heart, everything that you do. And your decisions are made and based upon him, not on you or anybody else. So that's, you know, how to be in relation with the Lord. And then, of course, you have to pray, you have to read your Bible, and you have to witness, you have to come to church, you know, just obeying the regular commands that God has told you to do. So if you're not even doing those four things, you know, you're, you're backsliding. And you will continue to backslide. And you'll end up as a backsliding Christian. And then, you know, see you at the judgment, literally, at the judgment seat of Christ. So those few things you have to do, pray, read your Bible, witness, and go to church, right? Then, when trials and those things do come, brethren, do not blame God. Do not go back to your sin. Don't look for any justification. You just have to go to the Lord. And then you got to examine. Something's wrong with my life. That's what you should do. Yes. Bob Jones Sr. says the problem is with you. It's not with me. It's not with your wife. It's not with your husband. It's not with your children. It's not with your oh, grandma, grandpa. Don't blame everything on Biden and Newsom, right? You got to look at yourself. The problem is with you. Go to the Lord. Why is this happening? Lord, do you want me to get closer to you? Or do I have some pride issues, you know? It's part of my life, you know, not balanced, Lord. Am I backsliding? You know? Then you, you, you talk to the Lord. Yes. You get right with the Lord in that way. Instead of always, okay, Lord, you've done it again. Okay. I'm going to Vegas today. Lord, you've done it again, you know. It's like you're blaming God. Lord, you know. I wanted to love my wife, but man, you threw this wrench at me. Man, I can't love her anymore. You know, same thing, my husband. Lord, why'd you do this to me? Like, children and everything. Yeah. And you're using it as an excuse for your justification not to live in the will of God. Yeah, so think about it, Christian. Where are you today as far as your fellowship with Lord Jesus Christ? Where are you today? When trials and temptation come in your life, where do you go? Do you go to sin? Do you relapse to your old ways? Or do you go to the Lord? Because it's going to happen. Especially people, I'm warning you, especially people where your life is like kind of smooth right now. It's like a perfect streamlined life. And then you don't see any troubles along the way. Then devil's like, Lord, hey, 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 let's test that guy. Let's test that woman, right? And then something comes right away. And at that moment, if you are in a right relation with the Lord, you're going to handle it correctly. If you're not, then you're going to go back to your sin. Because none of us here and listening does not have any trouble with sin. Everyone has trouble with sin. Amen. And there is that one certain sin or two, maybe three, could always get a hold of you. They're not far away. They're only one click away, one call away, one drive away. Yes. Very close by. You know why? Because the devil set it up already. You don't know, right? You don't know the spiritual battle that's going on behind the scenes, right? You know, without the protection from our Lord and Savior, you and I could have been eaten up alive by the devil. Amen. You know, he's a roaring lion, like a roaring lion. But the Lord has put a hedge around us. But if you don't appreciate the hedge that the Lord has put around us, the protection, and then you're like, oh, it's you. Remember, it's not the Lord. It's you who's going out of that protection. Yeah. The Lord's like, okay, just stay in there. Stay in there. 
But it's you who says, you know, Lord, mm -mm. you're not the solution. My solution's out there, and my solution's out there. The world, the devil, and the flesh. You open, and then you go. But you know, that's why the Lord is a fair God, and he gives everyone a free will. Forget about tulipers, everybody, right? You and I have free will, yeah. right? So the Lord says, okay, it's up to you. He never forces anything on you. You know, that's the great thing about faith, right? Yes. It's, it's your own free will, and you choose and you not to choose. Then, if those were to come, before they actually come, you have to get right with the Lord. Because those days are coming. And those days will come very, very soon. And when they do come, if you're not right with the Lord, unfortunately, telling you from my experience and seeing everyone around me and the hearing and then reading through the history, you're going to do the same thing again. Right? So... That's up to you. Wherever it is, right? There, it's all dirty sins. Whatever it is, you know, whether it's man, woman, you know, money, drugs, smoking, whatever sin out there, right? You're going to go back to it and you're going to do it. And you're going to try to hide it from your wife, your husband, your children, your mom, your grandma, everybody. You have it in your phone. You have it at somewhere. You miss somebody. And then you think it's... Kumbaya, and it's okay. But Lord has written down, Lord's recording everything. So if you don't get right with the Lord, then you read what you sow. You're going to pay for that sin. Yes. But not only you, though. You know who gets hurt along the way? Your family, church, and people around you in your life. So thirdly, right, you know, I mean, I'm going to finish this quickly. It's that, you know, you are still backsliding if you are in false balance, you know, if you think you are better than who you think you are. And last thing is when you don't fear God. Okay? Yes. That's it. If you don't fear God, you are going to still be in backsliding slate. To fear God is to hate evil. You know, the Bible says. Fear of the Lord is beginning of wisdom. Yes. Think about it. If I truly fear God, when the Lord says stay in in the boundary, stay in the hedges, I wouldn't go out because I fear him, right? Mm -hmm. The times that you commit sin is because you don't fear God. But God said, don't do it. If Lord was right in front of me, you know, as authoritarian, you know, dictator, who's going to rule the millennium, right? He said, don't do it. I'm watching you, right? 24-7. Man, it, say, say I was a smoker, right? I wouldn't even go close to the packets. Yeah. Because he's watching me. I mean, he, he could, like, destroy me just like that. But since we can't see him, right? Yeah. Since he's not as real to you, you're like, oh, you know, I'm just, I think I could get away with it. Yeah. Right? But if you do truly fear God, you're going to think before you do anything. Right? Fear of the Lord will trumpet over anything. You know, there's always a healthy fear. Yes. That's what healthy fear is. Amen. We have fear of going through the red light because you're going to get crushed, right? You, know? yes. you have fear of not eating poison because you're going to die, right? right? If I were to bring a, what is it, you know, rat poison or rat, you know, things, yeah. like, hey, here, here, take it. You know, it's healthy for you. You don't have to fear it. Only a fool will take it, right? Because yes. you're like, oh, I'm fearful, you know, of that. And if anyone has a, you know, nut allergies, right? They're deathly afraid of, you know, those nuts. Yes. But when it comes to our Lord and Savior, when it comes to God, are you really that fearful? I mean, he's your Lord and Savior who saved you from hell, but he's also holy God, 100% holy. And he means everything that he said in the word of God. Especially Galatians 6. I think Christians always take Galatians 6 for granted. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, thou shall he also reap. You reap what you sow. Every Christian listening here, if you've ever committed any type of sin after you've gotten saved or even before, you know, 
I mean, especially before, I mean, it's all washed away, but, you know, if you've been a drug in the past, don't think that suddenly, you know, your brain suddenly regenerates and it's suddenly you're the smartest person. You're still going to lose, have a lost memory. You're still going to have, you know, you know, blackouts here and there. Yeah. Because you rebought your soul. Especially after you've gotten saved, you have to realize. That's why 1 John 1 9 is so important. You know, you really want to get right with the Lord, get out of that backsliding state. You have to confess your sins and get right with the Lord, every single thing. Yes. Because you and I have to be accountable for every little sin after you've gotten saved, especially from your heart. Every sin that you've committed in your heart, in your mind, think about it. You know, you're like dirty thoughts, you know, adulterous thoughts, you know, hateful thoughts, angry thoughts, bitter thoughts, you know, contempt, you know, angry, everything. All of those, you got to be accountable if you do not get right with the Lord, if you don't confess it. Yes. And that's just the inner. But outside, everything that you've done, every idle word that came out of your mouth, think about it. Every stupid word that came out of your mouth, you know, cuss, everything, you got to be accountable for it. You got to get right with the Lord. Have you confessed every one of those sins? I don't think I did. I can't remember everything, right? But you got to ask the Holy Spirit to help you remember. You have to do it. Or else, truly, no one can get out of backsliding state unless they truly get right with the Lord by resolving their sin problems with Him. You will if you fear Him, right? I mean, if you fear God... You want to do what he wants you to do. Sometimes there's an ungodly fear, you know, like dictators out there, communists, right? You know, people don't do it because, you know, if they say, I, I raise my hand supporting USA, you're in North Korea, you go to concentration camp, right? So you're fearful of doing that, right? You know, but there's no freedom here. But over here, we have freedom, yes. especially freedom to serve the creator of the universe, Amen. Lord Jesus Christ. And then you have the freedom to get right, confess your sins, get right with the Lord, and start over. Have a good balance in your life, yes. right? Don't think of you're better than anybody. You're less than nothing. Amen. We all are just a wretched sinner saved by grace. Yes. Don't let pride go before us. And then with that, with the right fear, fear of God, then we could you know, get out of our backsliding state. You know, when someone asks you, are you backsliding? Are you still backsliding? Man, you know, what's your answer going to be, right? It'll be interesting, yeah. right? It's interesting. Some proud person will say, no, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, someone who's really close to the Lord will be like, you know, I rely everything on the Lord, you know? Every time I rely on myself, I backslide. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the... You know, correct attitude and approach. You and I cannot resolve this on our own. We have to go to the Lord. Yes. So we end up with this question always. You know, do you have the right relationship with Lord Jesus Christ? If not, you and I are backsliding. Let's pray. Dear and Father, many times we let the days go by without really checking our heart and our state, Lord. You know, thank God that you know, when we trusted you as our Lord and Savior, we won't have to ever worry about burning in hell. However, we can be out of fellowship with you, Lord, because of our sinful ways, our selfish ways, and just because you know, we think we're something we're not. We're just a wretched sinner, Lord, less than nothing. And help us to fear you, Lord. Each time we know that you know, we fail is because we don't fear you. Help us to fear you always. And do the normal things that we're supposed to do. Read the Bible, pray, witness, be at the church, and be in the ministry, Lord God. I pray that you'll be with everyone here and whoever is listening and who aren't able to make it, to be found faithful in you, trust in you, and not be in a such a backslidden state all of our Christian walk, Lord. Bless rest of services today, and above all, even so, come Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.